Bill Slim's background never suggested that he would become one of Britain's most outstanding generals during the 20th century. He was a truly inspiring general. To his troops, he was known as Uncle Bill. Modern-day military historians often view him as the British equivalent of the American general George Patton, being a commander who fought like no other British general. With the minimum of supplies and with the weather and the terrain against him, he turned the disaster of a lost war in Burma into a colossal military victory. He inflicted upon Japan their biggest land defeat of the war at the Battle of Imphal and Gehima, a battle that lies as testament to his outstanding ability as one of Britain's greatest ever commanders. Hello, three, five for six. Heavy gunfire from northeast. Can you deal with it? Over. In 1956, a military biography called Defeat into Victory was published at a time when, nine years after the end of the Second World War, the public appetite for memoirs about that conflict had been more than satisfied. Irrespective, this book became an instant success and the first edition sold out within just a few days. A couple of years later, the same occurred when the book was published in America. One critic wrote, It is a work of wisdom, modesty, grace and deep understanding and is an outstanding example of the best of British military memoirs. The author of this book was a man who had spent much of the 1930s supplementing his meagre army pay by writing novels and short stories under the pen name Anthony Mills. This person was none other than the British Indian Army General, Bill Slim. He remained largely unknown to the British public during the Second World War, even though he was the commander of, numerically, the largest army that Britain had ever put into the field. The British 14th Army, or as it was often called, the Forgotten Army. Before his biography was published, little had ever been written about Slim and his campaigns, while endless amounts had been published about other generals, including those who were far less capable, yet perhaps were greater self-publicists. Consequently, in 1956, his story was still to be told, a story that centers upon the British campaign in Burma. Before the war, the British had recognized that if there was to be war against Japan, Malaya and Singapore would likely be attacked. Conversely, they thought that the British colony of Burma would be safe from attack, and thus little thought or attention was given to its defense. In December 1941, Japan invaded Malaya, and by February 1942, they had captured both Malaya and Singapore. Quickly, Japan turned its attention to Burma, keen to avail itself of its oil supplies, and also to capture the supply route to the Chinese army, known as the Burma Road. In haste, one of Britain's foremost generals, Harold Alexander, was sent to Burma to take command of the various ramshackle military elements in the colony. They were referred to as the Burma Army. Alexander's arrival was too late to prevent Burma's capital, Rangoon, the hub of British military operations, from being captured by the Japanese. In response, the British quickly established an understrength corps called the Burma Corps, which was added to Alexander's forces. It consisted of the 7th Armoured Brigade, the 1st Burma Division, and the 17th Indian Division. Command of this corps was given to General Bill Slim, who was commanding the 10th Indian Division in the Middle East at the time. Previous to that, he commanded the 10th Indian Infantry Brigade against the Italians in the recapture of Ethiopia. The loss of Rangoon had put the British in a parlous state. 
Rangoon had been the center of their air cover, which was now taken over by the Japanese, leaving British troops under constant air attack. Supplies for the British Army were severely disrupted, as they now had to be brought from India, a near 1,000-mile route over some very long and tenuous roads. With the Japanese reinforced with a further two divisions, on the 21st of April 1942, Alexander had no option other than to order a general withdrawal across the Irrawaddy River. Then on the 26th of April, the British began their long retreat back to the Indian border. Throughout the withdrawal, Alexander and likewise Slim maintained a calm atmosphere that helped to maintain order amongst British troops, which helped to minimize losses. Bill Slim realized that besides the strategic difficulties that the British were suffering, his troops viewed the jungle as both a foreboding place and an impenetrable barrier. Consequently, they were inclined to restrict to operating along the few available roads. The Japanese quickly recognized this and knew they could move quite freely through the jungle. So whenever they ran into a British roadblock, they sent outflanking forces through the jungle to set up their own roadblock behind the British defenders. Being short of troops, the British had been concentrating the majority of their troops on the front line and therefore had little to no reserves to counter these Japanese tactics. It was a badly weakened army that joined the monsoon, eventually crossed into India in May 1942. But it was still a fighting force that had withdrawn in a controlled and orderly fashion, thus preventing any rout. It was also the longest withdrawal ever undertaken by a British army. Shortly after reaching India, Alexander was recalled to Britain as the designated commander of the new British American First Army that would land in Morocco and Algeria later that year. However, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, wishing to stem Rommel's advance in the desert, appointed him instead as the new British commander-in-chief in the Middle East. In this role, he would become responsible for overseeing the campaigns that expelled Rommel from North Africa. The Burma army was now brought under the command of the British Indian Army, with its units incorporated into the Indian Eastern Army, under the command of General Noel Irwin. They were given the task of defending India's eastern border with Burma against any possible Japanese attack upon India. Within the Eastern Army, Slim was given command of 15 corps in order to launch an attack upon an area in Burma known as the Arakan. Slim did not like Irwin's plans for this operation, which led to a disagreement between the two generals. Irwin, as army commander, bypassed Slim and personally issued orders to 15 corps divisions for the operation it turned into a total disaster that severely affected Allied morale and prestige in the region. At a press conference afterwards, Irwin blamed the defeat upon poor equipment, insufficient training, and a lack of motivation of the Allies in India. Irwin was sacked, and Slim was promoted to replace him as commander of the Eastern Army, which, at Slim's insistence, was renamed the British 14th Army. This army would contain a variety of different units drawn from the UK, from India, Africa, and the Gurkhas. The term Indian Army or Indian Division in this context refers to units that were administratively under the British Indian Army's control rather than from the army in the UK. The phrase does not refer to any particular ethnicity or nationality. From his experience of the fighting withdrawal from Burma, Bill Slim set about a program of renewal within the army, retraining and reordering the army to make it specifically prepared for jungle warfare. Troops were trained hard to enable them to undertake more aggressive tactics 
against the Japanese. It included placing an emphasis on off-road mobility, so heavy equipment was exchanged for mule transportable equipment that would be supplemented by aerial resupply. Motor transport was kept to a minimum because of its limited use with so few roads in Burma, most of which were in poor condition, especially during the monsoon season. He also trained his troops in the creation of defensive boxes as an effective way of dealing with the Japanese practice of infiltration. He encouraged the use of offensive patrolling, especially at night, not merely as an effective tactic against the enemy, but also as a way for soldiers to lose their fear of the jungle and to start believing that they were as good at jungle fighting as the enemy. While the defense of India's border was the Allies' initial concern, the main task given to Slim was the recapture of Burma. His preference for such an operation would have been to use amphibious tactics to outflank the enemy by repeatedly landing further down the coast of Burma. But demands on landing craft in both Europe and the Pacific meant insufficient where available. Consequently, Slim was forced to devise plans to drive the Japanese back through the jungle. Under his superb leadership and training, Slim transformed the British 14th Army from a shattered force that had been driven out of Burma in the spring of 1942 into a highly motivated army. The dozen predominantly infantry divisions under his command were numerically now the largest single field army that the British had ever mustered. Extraordinarily, given the fact that Slim was about to fight one of the most crucial campaigns of the war, his official rank at the time was still Colonel, but with a wartime rank of Major General. On top of this, he'd been made a temporary Lieutenant General when given command of the British 14th Army. While his contemporaries in Europe, Generals Alexander and Montgomery, were both about to be promoted to Field Marshals, Slim would have automatically returned to the rank of just Colonel had the war ended at this time. Slim's plans were based on his assessment that the Japanese army in Burma had to be defeated in battle if Burma was to be retaken. Given the logistics difficulties in that part of the world, Slim knew that it would be much easier to win a battle on his own ground rather than through an invasion of Burma. He moved his HQ from Barakpur, the current home of the East Indian Army just north of Calcutta, to close to the front line. Next, he sought to ensure that he safeguarded his two principal bases at Imphal and Dimapur, through which all his supplies would come. By the beginning of 1944, Slim had six divisions on the front line, with a further six held in reserve to the rear. His aim was to make it look to the Japanese that the Indian frontier was only lightly defended. The Japanese were already confident in their ability to defeat the British, and they viewed the capture of both Imphal, the regional capital, and Dimapur, an important railhead, as opening up for them an advance into India. Additionally, their army in Burma had just been doubled in size after the completion the previous year of the Burma Railway. The Japanese army under General Mutaguchi crossed the Chinwin River on the 8th of March, 1944, and then moved into India. It was soon clear that they were heading for Imphal. Slim immediately ordered four corps under General Jeffrey Schoons to create a defensive box around the city. This corps consisted of three British Indian Army divisions, to which a fourth, the 5th Indian Division, was added through an airlift into the city. Under Slim's plan, as the Japanese attacked Imphal, 
mainly from the north and the south, the British undertook a gradual fighting withdrawal through which they were able to seriously degrade the Japanese forces. A further advantage for the British was that as the box contracted, British defenses became tighter and Japanese supply lines longer. Over the next four months, often with bitter, close-quarter fighting, General Schoon skillfully executed Slim's plan, while never allowing the Japanese to get within 10 miles of the city of Infal. He was aided by constant resupply by air and a squadron of Spitfires that arrived and set up base at Infal Airport. Meanwhile, British military intelligence had failed to detect that a Japanese division was also advancing towards a small town approximately 80 miles to the north of Infal, which lay on the road between Infal and Dimapur. Here, at Kahima, the Japanese aim to cut the road, thus preventing supplies and reinforcements from Dimapur reaching Infal. But the Japanese did not reckon upon a remarkable man called Colonel Hugh Richards, who was the British garrison commander at Kahima. Richards, originally from the Worcester Regiment, had recently been forced to leave the Chindits as a senior commander when it was discovered that he was 10 years older than the maximum age allowed in that elite unit. By the 29th of March, the Japanese had reached Kahima and surrounded this hilltop town, which now became cut off. Stationed at Kahima, under Colonel Richard's command, were two and a half thousand troops. They included the 4th Battalion, the Queen's Own Royal West Kent Regiment, and the 1st Battalion, the Assam Regiment. The remainder, nearly half, were non-combatant lines of communication troops that now had no option other than to take up arms. Seriously outnumbered, Colonel Richard's garrison now faced attack after attack by a force of 15,000 Japanese soldiers. Despite continual shelling and mortaring, the British and Indian troops held a tight defensive perimeter centered on Garrison Hill in some of the most bitter close-quarter fighting of the entire Second World War. Gradually, they were driven into a smaller and smaller perimeter with, at one stage, only the width of the town's tennis court separating them from the enemy. Such was the savagery of the attacks and the heroism of the defenders, led defiantly by Colonel Richards, that this battle became referred to as the Stalingrad of the East. The efforts of these few men at Kahima had an enormous impact on the overall battle, a battle that would help to change the course of the war in Asia. Hurriedly, General Montagu Stopford's 33 Corps which had been in reserve, was moved forward to Dimapur. Slim immediately made the relief of Kahima one of Stopford's priorities, and he dispatched the 5th British Infantry Brigade to advance along the road to Kahima. But could they get there in time? On the 13th of April, Colonel Richards, who had been personally leading the fight on the front line with rifle and grenades in hand, radioed Slim's HQ, saying, We have two days maximum left, but we'll fight this battle to the last man with the last bullet. Richards and his remaining men had withdrawn into an area that was little bigger than the size of a large house. That night, the Japanese made a concerted night attack and were only prevented from breaking through the final lines of defense by ferocious hand-to-hand -hand combat as the British, the Indians, and the Gurkhas fought off the Japanese with bayonets, blades, and swords. Next morning, two battalions from General Stopford's 33 Corps reached Kahima. They managed to break through Japanese lines to reach the Kahima garrison, which by now was completely out of ammunition. The Japanese continued to attack, and the Battle of Kahima raged on for a further two months as more and more fresh British troops arrived. By the middle of June, what remained of the Japanese force at Kahima finally withdrew. The ground over which the battle had been fought resembled a battlefield from the First World War, 
with smashed trees, ruined buildings, and the ground covered in bomb craters, mud, and dead bodies. General Stopford's 33 Corps now pushed on down the road to join up with General Schoon's 4 Corps at Imphal, where the fighting had been no less ferocious. If the Allies had suffered deprivation and high casualties in the battle, those suffered by the Japanese were even worse. They had never planned for the Allies to hold out against their attacks at either Imphal or Kehima, and consequently their logistic support was insufficient. With mounting shortages, especially of food, the Japanese suffered huge losses as Slim's army broke out and attacked them. Field Marshal Adam Brooke, the head of the British Army, had written his diary at an early stage during the battle, saying, I see disaster staring us in the face. But Slim was always more confident that his tactics would prove successful, although it came close to disaster at various stages at both Kahima and Imphal. The Japanese had managed to encircle formations of the British 14th Army, but ultimately they were never able to defeat any of them. In the process, they lost over 60,000 men and exhausted themselves. Back in Britain, the battle went virtually unnoticed. The press and the public were engrossed with D-Day and the struggles to overcome the Germans in the Battle of Normandy. Nonetheless, the Battle of Infal and Kahima was a most crucial battle that had been won by the British Army. Nearly 70 years later, in 2013, this battle was declared to be Britain's greatest ever battle by the National Army Museum in London, placing it ahead of D-Day, Alamein, and even the Battle of Waterloo. Slim now drove the Japanese south, fighting through the monsoon while being supplied by air. His men crossed the river Chinwind into the Arakan and then on across the Irrawaddy. Slim's tactical and logistic planning now ensured more operational success. You know my plan? What it means is that we are attacking five Japanese divisions dug in behind a 2,000 yard wide river. And we've only got five divisions to do it with. Now, when I'm over the river, I've got to have another division. Well, sir, it's quite impossible with the airlift that's at present available. Well, we've got to cut everything to the bone and think of other way. Well, gentlemen, it's not the first time I've asked you to do the impossible. And what we've got to do is to remember the 14th Army motto. God helps those who help themselves. After more fierce fighting, Mandalay was captured in March 1945, and with it, much of the remaining Japanese army in Burma was cut off from its supplies. The route south to Rangoon was now open. By the time four corps reached the outskirts at the end of April, the Japanese had abandoned the city. Burma had now been retaken. It was a victory won through the courage and endurance of the troops and the superb leadership of Bill Slim. However, the following month, General Oliver Lees, the Army Group commander of Allied land forces in Southeast Asia, relieved Slim of command of the British 14th Army, which was already preparing for an invasion of Malaya. Slim was told that he would now command a new, smaller force to be called the British 12th Army, whose job it was to mop up the enemy in Burma. Slim refused this appointment, saying he would prefer to retire. As the news spread of his dismissal, the British 14th Army fell into turmoil. Field Marshal Alan Brooke in London was furious at not having been consulted by General Lees, or indeed by Field Marshal Claude Auchinleck, who was the Commander-in-Chief of the British Indian Army. Brooke put considerable pressure upon both Auchinleck and Louis Mountbatten, the Supreme Allied Commander in Southeast Asia, to have the decision reversed. General Lees was at the time just one of three British Army Group commanders. He was forced now to reinstate Slim before being dismissed himself. Lees would never hold high command again and would never receive the substantive rank of full general that he would have expected. In his place, Slim was promoted to the substantive rank of full general and appointed to command all land forces in Southeast Asia. 
As the new commander, he reported on progress to everyone back at home. The war against Japan is going well. Our American allies in the Pacific have won great victories, and we have had our own successes in liberating the greater part of Burma. But the Japanese is a tough enemy, and much must be done before he will admit defeat. But now the resources that defeated Germany are becoming available for use against Japan. Nothing can stop us winning, but a great deal can be done to speed up and render less costly the final victory. With the end of the war, Slim returned to the United Kingdom and was made Commandant to the Imperial Defence College, today better known as the Royal College of Defence Studies. After two years there, he retired from the army. Having been brought up in an impoverished family in Birmingham, his career had been remarkable. In what was then a class-conscious military hierarchy, Slimman managed to gain a commission when joining the army at the outbreak of the First World War as a temporary officer without ever being trained at Sandhurst. He'd won his spurs during the First World War at Gallipoli and then in Mesopotamia, where he was awarded the Military Cross, before being granted a permanent commission at the end of the war with the Gurkhas in the British Indian Army. From there, he managed to rise to the top of the British Army in a military career that was nothing short of remarkable. But this is not quite the end of the story or his illustrious military career. Within 12 months of retirement, he was brought back to the army by the Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, who appointed him to the role of head of the British Army, a post known at the time as the Chief of the Imperial General Staff. This was a post that had been held so successfully during most of the war by Alan Brooke. He had been succeeded on Alan Brooke's suggestion by Bernard Montgomery. This appointment had not been the greatest success, and subsequently Montgomery's suggestion that he should be replaced by General John Crocker was rejected by the Prime Minister. Slim was promoted to Field Marshal and thus became the first and only officer from the British Indian Army to serve as Chief of the Imperial General Staff. He held the post for four years, from the start of 1949 until the end of 1952, when he was appointed Governor General of Australia. Throughout his military service, Slim had a close rapport with the officers and soldiers under his command. He trusted his officers to make the correct decisions without referring to him. He later wrote, I was, like other generals before me, saved by the resourcefulness and the stubborn valour of my troops. While head of the British Army, in appreciation of the troops of the 14th Forgotten Army, he established the Burma Star Association, an active organisation through which the spirit of comradeship within the army continued for many more decades. He addressed its members as their president at their first annual get-together. Then in 1943, while the Air Force was battling its way back into the skies over Burma, we the soldiers learnt across the Chindwin and in the abortive attacks in the Arakan that courage alone was not enough in Imphal and around Kohima, where body to body, with bomb and bayonet, you again taught the Jap who was the better man. And while you were doing that, your comrades, the Americans and Chinese, helped by thousands of you, air-landed behind the enemy, opened the road to China. George MacDonald Fraser, the creator and author of the Flashman novels, served in the Border Regiment in the British 14th Army during the Burma campaign. He wrote a slim, I see him clearly, with that robber baron face under that Gurkha hat and his carbine slung, looking like a rather scruffy private with a general's tabs which of course is just what he was. Bill Slim was the man that was never born to be a British Army officer. He never came from a privileged background. He never attended a private school or even trained at Sandhurst. Yet he became one of Britain's greatest ever generals. He was the man that broke the mould of centuries of tradition within the British Army. <laughs>